I might have covered verse 825 already in the previous video. But if so, let's have another look at it anyway. Verse 825. If mind is set in motion, somewhere, somehow, the cause is an unreal one. It is not complete. How can one know of its momentary disappearances? If mind is set in motion, somewhere, somehow. The motion of the mind takes the form of the attention. It's the attention which is moving all over the place. The attention always somewhere, the attention is always somewhere, and it gets there somehow. Where the attention can be, it can be absolutely anywhere. It can be on a physical object, it can be on a thought, it can be on a sensation, it can be on a feeling. And why should it be in any of these places? Why should it be focusing in on, on any of these places? Well, this brings us to the somehow. It depends on our sensibilities. It depends on what is being presented at any particular moment. This is the cause, and it's described as an unreal one. What does it mean by saying that the cause is an unreal one? Because these causes seem quite real. The answer, I think, is in the next phrase, it is not complete. Something is not real if it doesn't bring resolution, satisfaction. It's like the emotions generated when you're reading a work of fiction or, work, or watching a movie. Feelings are generated. But the cause is only a story. It's only a story. And you might think, well, yes, okay, that's fair enough. But surely the causes which direct my attention are real. Well, actually, they're only stories too. They're only stories too. Which is why we go through life with a sense of dissatisfaction, a sense that we're not getting quite the full picture. There's something that we're missing, and that's addressed in the last phrase, how can one know of its momentary disappearances? Most of the time we're on automatic. The attention flicks from one thing to the next. And we don't question this. It moves with the speed of light. It says here there are momentary disappearances. But we're not aware of them, it seems to be instantaneous, the way the attention can move from one thing to another. My attention was momentarily distracted there by the sight of something on my foot. My feet are doing strange things these days. But never mind that. I brought the attention back. <laughs> but does the attention actually go anywhere between moving when it moves from one thing to another? Well, we don't know. It says, how can one know of its momentary disappearances? Because when it disappears, the attention goes. It's like asking, how can you know you're in deep, dreamless sleep? 
You can't. And this is quite an important point. But let's try and be clear about what it is. There isn't anything particularly momentary about deep sleep. You can be in deep sleep for more than a moment. Now this verse seems to be addressing the possibility that between shifts of the attention the mind disappears. And I think this is a logical argument actually. Because the mind is only active when the attention is active. This is what the mind is. It's the moving attention. So when the attention moves from one thing to another, it must have disappeared in the space between moving from one thing to the next. That might seem like it's instantaneous. The attention just simply shifts from one thing to another, a bit like a quantum leap. First it's in one place and then it's in another place. There's no, there's nothing in between. But there is because the, the attention is driven. It's driven by our sensibilities. So it's not instantaneous. There has to be a reason for the attention, for the attention shifting from one thing to another. And that reasons in our sensibilities. And this is what we can become mindful of. Why is the attention moving from one thing to another? In particular, why is the attention caught up in certain thoughts? This is very useful if you're meditating and you find yourself playing out some scenario, maybe replaying a scenario from the past or replaying or creating a scenario based on events that might happen in the future. So it's interesting to notice how we get to these scenarios from whatever it is, is our anchor of meditation, if we're focusing on the breath or focusing on ambient sounds, how do we get from that to thinking about what you're going to say to so and so because of the way she looked to your husband or something like that. So there are links going on. There's a shift from one, one object of attention to another. And these shifts are automatic based on our sensibilities, which we're usually fairly unconscious of. So we can practice this, we can practice seeing how the attention shifts from one thing to another, especially if we're attempting to do some formal meditation. So the point of this is, is in contrast to realization itself, described in the next verse as the attainment of the yogins, verse 826. The attainment of the yogins, gold, the Buddha relics and the heavenly palace of Apashvara are indestructible by any worldly agencies. So this is in contrast to the mind which is always flitting in and out of existence. We've got permanence here and some of these examples are quite interesting. So the attainment of the yogins, well this is the result of successful enlightenment practice. It means you're coming back, you're allowing the attention to rest in itself. Consciousness is resting in itself. And the author here has obviously tried to come up with other examples in contrast to the 
the fleeting mind. Gold. Gold is valuable because it's it doesn't mix with anything else. It's relatively permanent. It's immune to chemical reactions. Although I think modern technology might have something to say about all of that. But this is the traditional understanding, as is the indestructibility of the Buddha relics. It's obviously an item of faith that the Buddha relics are indestructible. But let's leave that one. The next one's quite interesting, the heavenly the heavenly palace of Abhashra. This is one of the heavens of the Arupa Loka, the formless, the formless world. And it's supposed to be a place which is untouched by cosmic dissolution, when the universe is ultimately consumed by flames, by fire. Well, the flames don't reach this particular heaven, and in fact, it's where all the souls live that get reborn, that populate the new cycle of creation when the universe is born anew. And uh, one of the interesting things about the beings that inhabit this heaven is that they're radiant. They go around exclaiming, Aho Sukham, which means, oh, the joy, the bliss, the bliss. Because they are inhabiting the realization of unconditional joy, which has been one of the themes of these videos, of these, of these verses, that our joy and our happiness need not be determined by what is going on. When we're practicing, when we're practicing enlightenment, we come to that point. We come to that point and that realization that well, it's almost an opportunity to explore, an opportunity to explore how happy it's possible to be, completely unfettered by any other consideration. We have no need to allow our emotions to be dictated by what is going on. Why should we buy into that? Why should we not buy into the possibility that we can decide to be as happy as we want to be? And so as enlightenment practitioners, we can start experimenting with this. What is our happiness dependent on? We go through life believing that our happiness is dependent on all sorts of conditions. And this is true in a very limited sort of way. If we can realize that our happiness need not be dependent on any conditions. Well, this is the true meaning of liberation, isn't it? How liberating, how, how, how can anything be more liberating? Is this a possibility? Is this a possibility? Well, let's explore. Why should our state of well-being be destroyed by any worldly agency? So this is a contrast to the, the fleeting mind, the fleeting attention. And verse 827, 
which pushes the point home even further. Ever abiding are the truths attained by the Buddhas and their perfect knowledge. The nature of Buddhahood as realized by them. How can there be momentariness in them? I've said before that consciousness comes and goes. There isn't actually enlightenment, there's only enlightenment practice. And enlightenment comes and goes. As an enlightenment practitioner, I actually spend much of my time in ignorance. But when I'm practicing and consciousness is resting in itself, then this is, this is eternal. There's nothing momentary about it. It's always available, always accessible. So if we think of enlightenment as a thing, which is not, it's always there, it's always here. But realization, realization of it comes and goes. But when successfully practicing, you realize that there is nothing momentary about it. In fact, when the mind stops, and it stops when it's looking to answer a question, even like, where did I put my keys? If you really want the answer to this, you have to stop for a bit. The mind has to stop and be still, and the answer will pop up. The answer to all problems come from this, come from something beyond the mind. The mind receives the answer, it doesn't generate the answer. So the scientist and the artist, when they're struggling with the problem, or any, or any of us when we've got a problem, we think about it, we play it over in our mind. But the answer doesn't come from the mind. The answer comes when you're still, when the mind is still, and then the answer pops into the mind. So this is the eternal source of all creativity. It's the ground of all mental activity. It's the ground of all all existence. And this is what we consciously touch base with when we're practicing. <coughs> 